Hello and welcome to Synchronicity Talk Radio for your mind, body, and soul. I'm your host, Marie Bernard, and today we are speaking with Helene Segura. She is the inefficiency assassin. Helene is a time management consultant based in San Antonio, Texas. She combines neuroscience, educational psychology, and pop culture to teach her individual clients and keynote and training audiences how to improve their efficiency during their work days so they can have a life outside of it. Her website is helenesegura.com, and if you're watching this on YouTube, I will post a link to that below. You can also find it on citr.ca in the archives there. And before we bring Helene onto the call, I'd just like to start off with a bit of an intentional meditation. So if you're in a place that's safe to do so, please do close your eyes, but you can keep your eyes open if it's not in a safe place. And if you're able to, place your hand over your heart. And just breathe into your heart. Imagine that you're breathing into your heart. I've learned this through Marcy Shimoff, who learned this through the Heart Math Institute. And so just visualize or sense whatever is easier for you. Your breath going into your heart. And as you're breathing in, Feel love entering your heart. And as you exhale, just let go of anything that is draining you, any negative energy. You don't have to focus on it. Just let it go through your out breath. And again, we're breathing love into our hearts. And anything that needs to let go, just let it go with the out breath. And today, as we're speaking with Helene, may this conversation truly serve and bless all of us listening. Because the more efficient and productive we're able to be in our lives, the better we feel in our lives and the more time we have to invest in self-care and making the world a better place, which is why I feel it's so important to have this conversation today. And may this interview come to whoever is most needing it and most ready to be changed by this information. And another breath in to our hearts and just relaxing on the out breath. Mm. Welcome to the show, Helene. Thank you, Marie. I don't think I've ever started out a show feeling so blessed and peaceful. Oh, yay. I'm glad it's working then. <laughs> Yeah, so thank you for that. Thank you. Well, today, uh, this will not air until next week, but right now, as we're speaking, it is International Day of Peace. Did you know that? I saw that on one of the headlines earlier. Yeah, I didn't know about it until I logged on to Facebook this morning, but I think that that's wonderful, and I'm so thankful that we can start out the show with a little meditation because the the more grounded we feel in our lives the better we're able to treat everyone else in our day i totally agree with that awesome and so actually that kind of totally relates to what you're doing uh let's talk a little bit about how you discovered this whole efficiency thing why why did it become important to you I started out as a teacher in a Title I school when I first graduated from college. And teachers, as many folks out there know, are very overworked. And so I felt myself drowning in paperwork and tasks and so many things that needed to be done and still be a good quality focused teacher for all the students when I was in front of them. And I discovered that I just did not want to have that kind of stress in my life. So I turned to 
looking into time management, looking into organization, how can I improve efficiency so I can have a life outside of work but still do an awesome job for those kids who are in front of me. And this eventually snowballed into me teaching the students how to be more organized, and then eventually I opened up my own business teaching others. Oh, I love that, Helene, because as whether we're a teacher, a manager, a parent, or a partner in a relationship, the way we relate to other people, if we're frazzled and overwhelmed, uh, actually, you probably are totally aware of this because of the neuroscience that Mm -hmm. you focus on, but we have mirror neurons. So if you come to your class all frazzled, that leaves everyone else in the class feeling the same way. Exactly. And just like if we come home from work and we're a complete wreck and then we just start snapping at spouse or kids or anybody who's around us, they begin mirroring us. And you can't have a conversation and a nurturing relationship that way if everybody is just walking around growling. So that's why it's so important to be as peaceful as possible. Oh, I love that. And so it's perfect that we're talking on International Day of Peace. Yes, it is. It was meant to be. Yay, yay, yes, because last time we tried to do an interview (laughs) through the Internet, and that didn't work, so now we're doing it over the phone, and I'm so thankful that I'm able to clearly hear you and we're able to communicate effectively. So let's jump into, um, maybe you can tell us the story behind the name, the Inefficiency (laughs) Assassin. Well, that name came about because I am not a good salesperson. I am lousy at marketing. My strength lies in teaching people and discovering how to be more efficient. So I took a marketing class, and I was told, well, you know, the title productivity consultant or time management consultant is extremely boring. So we went through this whole exercise of what can your title be? And it needs to talk about what you actually do for your clients. So I was going through those exercises, and I also happened to have a deep love for spy movies and thrillers, novels, detective novels. So combine all of that with a gin and tonic, and that is how the Inefficiency Assassin title was born. (laughs) One of the things that you mentioned about making it more interesting, I'm wondering about the relationship between efficiency and making things a little bit more interesting and exciting that is very much a part of becoming more efficient because you basically have to play mind games with yourself most of the time if we are dragging our heels on getting something done i.e. procrastination it's probably because it's not completely enjoyable to us so if we want to be more efficient be more effective and not just do things more quickly but do things more quickly and still in a quality manner then Sometimes we do have to play those mind games with ourselves and try to find a way to make something more pleasing so that we'll get something done. For instance, the first thing that's coming to my mind right now, probably because I just finished laundry last night, is laundry. I used to totally detest putting laundry away, and I tell myself all the time, oh, this stinks, and it takes forever, and I just whine and complain, and I would go dump the clothes on the guest bedroom bed and just leave them there for the whole week and so everybody would have to go pick out their clothes from this pile and so finally I realized well you know what I spend more time complaining than it actually takes to fold the clothes so really this isn't so bad so sometimes we have to shift our mindset about something to make a task more pleasing and that will make us more likely to do it. Hmm. Actually, I wanted to ask you about mindset because that is a big part of how you look at efficiency. Mm-hmm. It's not just the the practices and the nuts and bolts. It's actually shifting how you think about things. Exactly. And that's one of the reasons why New World Library wanted to publish my book, because there are so many productivity books out there, but they realized the difference, and this one was taking it up to a higher level and realizing that there is more to time management than the type of calendar you use or whatever task app that you have on your phone. Those are important tools, like you said, nuts and bolts, but it really goes back to mindset. You need to have a clear vision 
of what you want to do with your life. What do you want to do with your career? What do you want to do when you are outside of work? So once you clarify what your priorities are and you create measurable targets, measurable goals, you will suddenly, just from that, become more efficient because you will start making decisions about how to use your time based on whether or not what you're going to do is going to support those priorities, those goals, and those targets that you've set for yourself. Awesome. Well, I know that you have stories in the book. The name of the book is The Inefficiency Assassin, Time Management Tactics for Working Smarter, Not longer. So Helene, I'm wondering if you have uh, an example or a story of the difference that mindset makes. Oh, absolutely. I had uh, one of my clients who was in the public relations field, and she just absolutely detested putting together proposals. She would wait until the 11th hour, literally, I mean the middle of the night, to finish a proposal for a client. And that proposal was due the next day, so you're not doing your best work if you're trying to pull an all-nighter. And what we did was we reframed how she thought about proposals. And she began to realize that if she does not complete a proposal and get it into the client not only on time but well done, then she doesn't have a chance at earning that piece of business. So she switched her mindset from, oh, I need to do this paperwork, to, wow, I have money in my hand. How can I go take this over to this prospective client so that money will come back to me? So she started looking at it as more than just this tedious thing that she has to do. This is an opportunity that is going to bring her income, which will help bring peace to her life because she won't be worried about the bills. Mm. So it sounds like what you're saying is that when we focus on the larger goal instead of the immediate task right exactly we, it helps to shift our perspective um mm -hmm. yeah i like that like you said about the laundry yes it's kind of a pain to have to fold all the laundry and put it away but when you focus on how much time it saves at the end of the day when people actually know where their clothes are and don't have to go sort through the whole pile, it makes a huge difference in you, you can see the value of taking that extra five minutes. Oh, definitely. And literally you can see because when you leave your clothes in a pile all week, they're really wrinkled. So when you hang up your clothes or fold them like you're supposed to, you don't end up with all these wrinkles. And Helene, that's funny. Um, and I'm wondering also, um, because for me, I do the same thing with my laundry a lot of times is I'll just kind of keep it in the laundry basket after it's clean. And then it, for me, I see that there. I see it as mess. And mm -hmm. emotionally, I might not immediately pick up on it, but I do notice that when my environment is cleaner, I have more energy, I think more positively, I feel less overwhelmed. Oh, definitely. We have visual clutter in our environments and we also have auditory clutter in our environments. And clutter doesn't necessarily mean that you have all these stacks and stacks and stacks of um, papers and files or you have mounds and mounds of clothes. It can be something as benign as you have 10 post-it notes right next to um, the wall in, in your office where you sit. And so that is visual clutter if there are things that are ha hanging over your head. So that's why it's really important to not necessarily walk in and say, yes, my office needs to look like a museum so I can think, but you want to take away as many of those distractions as possible because subconsciously they make us less efficient and slow us down, and that just drags us into the dumps when we realize at the end of the day that we haven't concentrated traded as much as we wanted to and therefore did not get as much done as we wanted to. So Helene, I'm wondering how much either less time do you have to spend at work or how much more do you find that you get done now that you've shifted your mindset? It will depend on how much a person was losing in the first place. 
the average person loses up to three hours a day from procrastination, distractions, and overwhelm. And it's not like they lose all of this time all at once. So you never hear anybody say, well, I lost from 1 o'clock to 4 o'clock yesterday because I was procrastinating and then got distracted and got overwhelmed. No, instead they're time leaks. So we'll lose 30 seconds here, 5 minutes over there, 2 minutes that way. And it's not until you start paying attention and being fully present and understanding where your time goes that you realize, oh, wow, this is where my time is going. So going back to that public relations client who I mentioned earlier, she realized that she was losing 45 minutes a day just from using email as a procrastination crutch and clicking on links and reading articles so once she realized that's where her time was going she was able to instantly gain back those 45 minutes a day because she would catch herself when she was about to do it and then stop other clients have realized that when they added up all of their procrastination time it might have been 90 minutes to two hours so once they realize that they're doing it and they take that time back then they're gaining back two hours so the amount of time that you're going to gain back actually depends on how much time you're letting leak out right now. Okay, Helene, part of my job is social media management. And this is an, a constant <laughs> frustration for me because I'm actually working, I'm using air quotes, when I log on to Facebook or Twitter. However, the amount of time that it get, takes me to accomplish what I set out to do, it might, if I was not looking at anything else, it might take me five minutes. But because mm -hmm. of the, the vortex of information that we get sucked into once we get onto the internet, it could be two or three hours. So... Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, yes, I'm entertained the whole time, but then I wake up from this haze and realize, oh, my gosh, I didn't even get that five minutes of work done. Right, exactly. That's why it's so critical. As much as people don't like to hear that they need to make a list, you really do. Because if you don't have something in front of you to get you refocused when you start going down a rabbit hole, then you will continue down that rabbit hole. So in the, the case that you're talking about, what I would recommend is you literally have written down what are the, the two or three tasks that you are supposed to do while you're in social media. And then in addition to that, set a timer. So that way, when the timer goes off, if you haven't done those tasks yet, you realize, oh my goodness, I let myself go again. I need to reset that timer and make sure that I get focused back on these tasks. So you still might lose some time when you go down a rabbit hole, but you won't lose those two hours because you're setting your timer to interrupt any rabbit wholeness going on. So you'd set your timer for five minutes or 10 minutes, however long you think you should be spending in there. One of the things that I've managed, I've just figured this out in the last couple of months, um, is that if I'm doing quotes, because that's part of like Twitter and Facebook is people post inspirational quotes, I will take my laptop, I will go to a coffee shop and put it on airplane mode so I'm not on the internet. Mm -hmm. And then I will use the book and go through and pull out the quotes at that time because if I'm at home and I'm getting those notifications and I'm on the internet, it's just mm -hmm. so easy to get sucked in again. Well, you need to give yourself some gold stars because you just hit the nail on the head on taking out some major distractions. One is the internet because it's so easy just to hop on there to look up one quick thing and then before you know it, you've looked up a hundred long things and that's where part of the time goes. And then the other gold star is for realizing that notifications are disruptive. The average person takes approximately 60 seconds to get their brain back into focus when they switch tasks. So if we are constantly looking over at what the notification is for, is it for a text, is it for an email, what's going on, do, do I have a new uh, like on Facebook, each time we look at that notification, we are costing ourselves approximately one minute of time. So think about how many times you do that during the day. So I am so proud of you for turning off the Internet, putting it in airplane mode, and then also realizing that the distractions are just getting in the way. Wow, thank you. And I, I noticed that when uh, back when I was dating a lot and I would get texts, I noticed how if someone 
was trying to have a text conversation with me, it actually got really overwhelming because I was constantly pulled away from what I was doing. And so I started turning off the notifications. But um, I do notice, I mean, if we're sitting down to do work and our phone goes off, 10 times which is probably pretty average for most people's phones in an hour Mm -hmm. that's at least 10 minutes and then when you say that it it distracts you for about 60 seconds does that is that from the time that you're distracted to the time when you actually can immerse yourself back into the project yes So let's say that you're sitting at your desk working on some kind of paperwork and then you hear that notification, that buzz go off on your phone. And so you turn, you look at the phone, okay, you check to see who it is, I don't need to pick up this text or answer right away, and so you turn back. And so in that moment of deciding that you're going to turn back to the original task, that's when the clock starts ticking. So while you may look back at your paperwork, it can take up to a minute for your brain to get back into the same groove that it was in before. It's like when you when you start out a project, a lot of times you might fumble a little bit or you don't really have a routine yet, but after you've been working on this project for maybe 10 minutes, you start to realize, oh, if I do things in this order, then I can do it more quickly. So when you get into this little pattern or some kind of habit, then you are in a groove and you are a lot more productive that way so when we have to turn our focus somewhere else that pattern is broken and we need to then start over finding that pattern and getting back into the groove well Helene that brings up two different thoughts for me the first is so it's 60 seconds up to 60 seconds of time and attention lost and that's only if you have the self-discipline not to get sucked into whatever that notification was calling for Right, exactly. And researchers at UC Irvine have found that when somebody in an office gets interrupted and asked to do a different task, they can take up to 25 minutes to get back to that original task that they were on because now they're trying to do something for somebody else. Mm. And I also can imagine that just knowing that that's there waiting for you can add to that sense of pressure and overwhelm, which even if you are able to refocus back on the task, that's Mm -hmm. kind of pulling at your energy and focus in the back of your mind. Oh, yeah. Even if it's something as simple as a Facebook like. So if you have the Facebook or the Twitter icon on the home screen of your phone and you see, oh, it says one, that means, uh, you know, one person has responded to me. Oh, it says three. I wonder who those people are. And so when you keep looking over at that, that's distracting you from getting back to the task at hand. And then the next thought that I'd had when we were talking about that that distraction is when you were talking about refocusing back on the task and getting into that groove, there are a few a lot of research now um, about that sense of flow or that sense of being in the zone and how much that adds not only to our productivity, but our health, our happiness, and our satisfaction with life. So if we're constantly pulled away, that inhibits our ability to get into that state of flow. Oh, absolutely. And that's why it's so important that you have these blocks of time where you can just work on something in complete focus and you're not allowing interruptions to come in. And I'm not talking about, excuse me, blocking off, let's say two hours at a time. It doesn't need to be that long. It can be as short as 10 minutes. It is so much better to have 10 focused minutes than eight hours of just flit flitting around and working on whatever lands in your lap. I have quite a few ADD or ADHD clients and for some of them, their attention span is only seven to eight minutes. And that's how long we set the timer for in the beginning. But that seven to eight minutes of focus time is revolutionary for them because they've never understood how to focus for even that long because that's a long time to them. And then eventually we increase the time. So I don't want people to feel like, oh, my gosh, I have to block off hours and hours. No, even if you just block off that 10 to 15 minutes so you can focus and get 
15 minutes of quality work done, you'll begin to see how much more productive you can be if you do that more often throughout the day. Oh, that's awesome. Helene Segura, she is the author of The Inefficiency Assassin, Time Management Tactics for Working Smarter, Not Longer. And Helene, you were just mentioning clients with ADD and ADHD and having their focus be about seven to eight minutes. I'm not sure what the average attention span is for someone who doesn't have ADHD, but I don't imagine it would not would be much longer than that. I would say that based with the clients who I work with, just in, in my demographic, folks who are challenged with their time, that some of them can last mm, maybe about 30 minutes, and there are a few outliers who can work for just four or five hours straight once they're in the zone. But Everybody is different, and that's why I think it's so important not to give an exact number that you need to chase for how long you need to stay focused. You need to stay focused for as long as your brain can handle it, and your focus time can actually change depending on what you're working on. So for me, because I love looking at graphics, I'm not good at marketing, but I like looking at graphics, I might be able to work for an hour straight just going through graphics and deciding what's going to be best in the next presentation that I'm going to be doing. But when it comes to accounting, which I don't like quite as much, I might be able to focus for a grand total of 16 minutes. So there's no magic number. It depends on not only your attention span, but your attention span when working on different types of tasks. Mm. That's really interesting, Helene, because I've noticed that um, in the past I have procrastinated on any kind of financial paperwork, taxes, mm -hmm. monthly reports, even paying bills. I'm, I mean, it's easy now. You can set up just having it automatic from your mm -hmm. bank account. But having to focus on those numbers caused a lot of stress for me, so I would procrastinate, which was kind of constantly tugging at my energy all day, all year. And mm -hmm. I find that when I actually sit down and do the task, whatever that task is, if I, if I say, okay, I'm going to break it up into small pieces to do my taxes, and the first task I'm going to do is gather all of the papers or receipts, if I'm able to, to just focus on that one thing, it's actually fun is maybe a bit of a stretch, but it actually <laughs> feels satisfying to accomplish mm -hmm. that. Yeah, Marie, another gold star for you, because that is one of the ways that you can battle procrastination. Now, the solutions for procrastination depend on the reason, but you understood what your reason was. You just do not look forward to working on finances and taxes and all that good stuff. And so if that is the case, if you don't like to do something, the best thing you could do is literally list out what are all the different steps it would take for me to work on this particular task. And just like you did, you worked on it a little bit at a time. And so that way you, you don't have to force yourself to do this three-hour task when you can break it up into five or ten-minute segments. And when you're able to see, oh, wow, I finished the first step. Hey, I finished the second step. That motivates you to keep going, and so the procrastination will lessen. So it sounds like having those smaller steps where you feel that sense of accomplishment really helps more than focusing on the huge goal of I've got to get my taxes done. For most people who have a challenge with time management, yes, because part of the reason why they have this challenge is that it's overwhelming to focus on the big goal, but once you can just focus on all the little steps that need to happen, then it seems that much more doable. Now, there are other folks out there who can work on the big picture, and that's fine. So it's not like they need to change what they're doing, but if you are the type of person who looks at the big picture and that's what causes you to procrastinate or you realize you drag your feet on things when you know you shouldn't, then the next step you would take is breaking apart that task into small chunks, small steps. So that way you can just do a little at a time and it doesn't seem so bad. Awesome. Well, Helene, we're talking about your book, The Inefficiency Assassin, and your book is... is broken up into three different 
ways of learning. So maybe we can talk a little bit about that. Sure. Um, the way I formatted the book is based on, number one, how easy will it be for somebody who doesn't have time to read the whole book to jump into the table of contents and look at a chapter and say, oh my gosh, that's what my problem is, so this is the chapter that I need to read. So it's formatted so it doesn't have to be read in order. But if you were to take a step back from the itty-bitty pieces and look at the big picture, then you'll see that it's divided into those three sections. So the first part is create clarity, the second part is implement structure and flow, and then the third part is assemble your team. And so those are the key uh, principles to understand in order to do more with the time that you have in the day. So creating clarity means you understand what those priorities are and those targets, and you're focused on those each day because, like I said earlier, that will help you make better decisions about how you use your time. And then when you move into implement structure and flow, that is all about how to handle the different components of the day that you need to stay in control of. Because if you understand how to control these five major components, then your days are going to be a lot smoother. Then once you have those uh, functions in place, then you can start moving on to other people. And that's where the third part, assemble your team, comes in. Even if you are a solopreneur, even if you don't like to talk to other people, chances are at some point in your job you do have to work with somebody else. So it's important to understand how to involve those people and uh, communicate with them, set expectations, so that way they don't get in the way of you being more productive. And then the bonus in the end, um, the, the fourth part, is the situational solutions. So that's where I've taken the 13 most common walls or roadblocks that my clients have hit, and I've listed things out by situation, like procrastination or always running late. And so that way you can take a look at, oh, well, this was happening to Helene's client, and this is what they did. Hey, that's what I can do also. And you're able to learn from the case studies that are in the book, and you can then apply what other people have done to be successful, so that way you can be successful. Thank you, Helene. And there's something about some kind of script ideas for what to say. Where does that come into the book? That comes in both in the third part in Assemble Your Team and then also in the Situational Solutions. Now, what's missing quite often in other books is that they give you these great strategies and tactics and you know you want to do that, but what it comes down to is communicating with yourself and with others. Most of the folks who I work with, they want to do these things that I've listed in the book and that others have talked about, but they don't know how to articulate that to the people who they're working with. So that's why I've included those scripts. So that way you have examples of what to say to somebody without sounding antisocial or sounding like an ogre or sounding like, you know, Mr. Grumpy Pants. And from there, you don't have to stick to these scripts, but you at least have a springboard to start with, and then you can tweak them all that you need to and make it your own from your own personality. I really appreciate that, Helene, because there have been so many books that I've read and courses that I've taken where these theories and these tips are, I mean, they're great. As an example, um, there was one course I took where the guy was saying, get really good at telling stories because story is what draws people in. It helps people remember. It helps inspire. There's so many benefits to sharing information through stories, but there was no training on how to tell a good story, how to structure it. So I was like, okay, well, that's all well and good, but now I need to take another course <laughs> on how to tell good <laughs> stories. How to tell story. uh, exactly. And, you know, that's part of the reason why I've broken up the individual chapters the way I have, because we are all at a different level of knowledge and expertise. So some people need the extra explanation of why that is what you need to do and how you need to do it. Whereas some people, uh, it's just a refresher and they say, oh yeah, 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 that's right, I need to go back to doing that. 
So that's why there's a section of just a list. These are the tactics that you need to do. So those who just need the refresher, they can jump back in a little more quickly. But for those who need that in-depth learning, there is a different part of the chapter that you can read. So it's not like you're tied to the entire chapter. You know how much you know or how much you don't know. So you can choose which bits and pieces you need to digest for yourself. Thank you, Helene. Can we talk about how procrastination is opportunity's natural assassin? <laughs> yes, procrastination seems to get in the way of opportunity. But what's interesting to note is that psychologists define procrastination as the act of wanting to feel better now. I mean, who doesn't want to feel better now? Who wants to be in a bad mood or who wants to be unhappy? But when you look at that definition, then you start to realize, well, wait a minute. Procrastination is the adult version of a two-year-old. I don't want a tantrum because we want to do something else to feel better in the moment instead of doing what's in front of us or needing to make a decision about something that's right in front of us. So procrastination can kill opportunity because so many times we have opportunity right there in front of us, but because we think it's something that we don't like or because we're nervous about making exactly the right decision, then we tend to shy away and go find something else to do that's a whole lot easier. And a lot of times when we procrastinate, we will jump into our electronic devices because there are so many mindless things that we can do on there, and that's how we escape and lose out on opportunities. So can we talk about maybe a, some examples of some of the opportunities? Like are you talking about the opportunity to speak to the person next to you on an airplane so you're distracting yourself because of social anxiety? Or what, what kind of opportunities are we missing out on that we might not even be aware of? It could be the social anxiety. It could be you're losing out on the opportunity to interact with your loved ones in the household and build a more nurturing relationship with them. It could be that you are losing out on the opportunity to complete a task where if you completed it right then and there, you would give yourself double the amount of time later on to go have fun. So there, procrastination is basically setting up a roadblock in front of yourself. And that's why it's really important to ask yourself when you catch yourself beginning to procrastinate, you catch yourself wanting to go off task or do something else, ask yourself this, how will delaying this task or decision benefit me? Because most of the time it won't. And if it won't benefit you, then that's the motivation we need to get back into the saddle, get refocused, and look at that opportunity that's right in front of us. Hmm. Thanks, Helene. So I'm also wondering, you mentioned that one of the things that we can do is figure out the night before what our main tasks are for tomorrow. So can we talk a little bit about why we want to do that and how that might look? Sure. One of the main reasons why you want to do this in the late afternoon or evening to prep for the next day is because if you have any type of sleep issues, then getting all of this out of your head is going to help you sleep a whole lot better. Now, I do realize that there are medical conditions that can cause sleeplessness and insomnia, but the kind of sleeplessness I am talking about is when we have so much going on in our brains and our brain just won't turn off long enough to allow us to get that good night of sleep. And sleep is absolutely critical to time management because time management is truly all about mind management. We decide how we use every second, every minute, every hour of the day. And if our brains aren't fully functional because they're sleep deprived, then we end up making not so great decisions about our time. So reason number one why you want to do this at the end of the day is so you can sleep better and prep for the next day. Reason number two is because most people who walk into the office and don't have this list ready to go, tend to go straight to their email inbox, open it up, and then email runs their day. 
because they haven't decided ahead of time what the important things are that they need to do. And so they end up being not as productive. So what you'd want to do is take about the last 30 minutes of the day, and you're starting off at the 30-minute mark because you maybe haven't done this before. Eventually, this will take you maybe five minutes. So you start out with the last 30 minutes of the day, and you just reflect on what's come across your desk, what's come into your life, what conversations have you had, is there anything that you need to get scheduled on your calendar before it falls out of your brain, you forget about what you're supposed to do or any tasks that you need to get done. So you capture those, and then you take a look at your calendar for the next day. Because chances are you already have something scheduled. It's pretty rare when we have a blank day in front of us. So you might have um, a phone appointment at 8 o'clock. You might have a doctor's appointment at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. So those things are already scheduled, which means that you need to fill in your tasks that you want to complete around what's already scheduled. So you look at, a lot of people have this monster to-do list. It's miles and miles long where everything that they need to get done in life or in work is on this list. You take a look at it and pull out the top three things that need to get done the next day. What you need to get done so you can keep a roof over your head, so you can protect the health and safety of you and your family, what you need to do to get done so you don't get fired. So you start with those priorities, and then you can work your way down from there. But you take those three tasks and you schedule them into your calendar. Because when we just take a list of to-dos and we don't attach them to time blocks, we tend to overschedule ourselves, and then we end up depressed at the end of the day when we, quote, unquote, only crossed off five instead of all 20 things. But if you were to attach those 20 things to time blocks, you'd realize, wait a minute, there's no way I could have gotten this done in an eight-hour workday because there's 50 hours of work on there. So there's no need to set ourselves up for failure. So you schedule those top three tasks as early in the day as possible, and leave a little bit of padding in there when you schedule your time blocks. So if you have a project that you think you should finish in 30 minutes, make sure you give yourself at least 45, just in case something goes wrong. So you pad that extra time in there. And then you want to leave some space in your calendar for things that crop up. So it could be a fire that you need to put out, a figurative fire, or it could be this wonderful opportunity that just lands in your lap and you need time to address it. So this is where the second section in my book talks about implement structure and flow. You want to have this structure in your day so you understand what you're supposed to be focused on so you'll be more efficient. But at the same time, you need to have flow. You need to be willing and able to have flexibility if you need to flip-flop those time blocks around or if you need to squeeze somebody else in. So that's why you don't want to schedule every single minute of your day, just at least the morning part so you can get as much done as possible before um, anything lands in your lap. So those are the reasons why it's so important to sit down at the end of the day to schedule for the next day because when you wake up, you know exactly what you need to get done for the day and that's going to make you more focused and more efficient. Helene, I really like that you suggest we do that at the end of the day, whether that's at the end of the work day or the end of our day before bed, because a lot of uh, efficiency experts or motivational teachers say to do that in the morning. And for me, I've been trying to do it in the morning and I'm not in that zone yet. But at the end of the work day where I've been inspired, I know what is kind of on the track and what needs to be done and, and I have a lot more information at my fingertips because my mm -hmm. mind has been immersed in that all day so I love right. that you're saying do it in the, the end of the day rather than the beginning right and it goes back to being in the zone we were talking about that earlier how you get into a groove and so if you are doing this reflection and planning time at the end of your groove or in the zone time, then your brain is still focused on what needs to get done. Whereas if you're doing this first thing in the morning, even if you're a morning person, you've still got some cobwebs. You haven't been in the zone or in the groove since the day before, so it takes a little while to crank things up again. So that's why it's very helpful if you do this at the end of the day. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to start doing that now because I've been kind of beating myself up 
for not being better at doing it first thing in the morning because frankly I just don't feel as able to do it it makes way more sense at least for myself to do mm-hmm. it at the end of my work day uh, but you also talk about doing so doing those three main tasks and the, th- the things that are going to keep the roof over our head and keep the job but what about the tasks that might be a little bit more long term or as one example for myself uh, with the social media I've started making templates for things so that when I sim- can schedule things to social media all I have to do is the next time I want to schedule 20 posts all I have to do is change the date so to I was spending so much time throughout the day posting things on social media or scheduling things on social media one by one that I didn't really feel like I had the time to make these bigger templates but when I took the time out to do that it's actually saved me not only so much time but so much energy of worrying about what I need to get done next so where do you make room for that in your schedule Well, Marie, you did the exact right thing in that you changed your mindset because you stopped looking at creating templates as a waste of time or a loss of time. Instead, you looked at it as an investment in your future time. And so it really comes down to mindset. Do you want to take an hour and a half out of your time each day to work on this project that's going to go on for, say, the next three months? Or do you want to take an hour and a half tomorrow to put together a template or a timeline or a plan or something that's going to make life better? And then for the rest of the days, instead of spending an hour and a half, maybe you only have to spend 30 minutes on it. So in the beginning, there is some investment of time, but you are freeing up so much more time down the line. And that's why, again, it's important to go back to the big picture. Because if you're just looking at this one small space, oh my gosh, I have to spend two hours doing that? I don't have two hours? Step back and look at the big picture. Yes, two hours is a lot to ask for you, but if it's going to save you 20 hours in the long run, isn't that a great way to spend two hours? Hmm. Thank you, Helene. And, and that makes, all, I'm sure, to everyone listening right now, that makes perfect sense. But I'm wondering if there's a question or some kind of trigger that can help us to make that switch. Because for me, I didn't even see that that was a possibility for me because I had to learn how to, how to do the templates and I had to, there were all these things that were challenging for me. And so little limiting beliefs came up, little fears, energy Mm -hmm. blocks. And once I did it, obviously the, the time saving was huge, but do you have any kind of like a coaching question that we might be able to ask ourselves to open up that different level of perception? The first question I would ask is, is there an easier way to do this? And if you can ask yourself that question, if not every day, then every couple of days, then your brain will start looking for patterns, start looking for new ways of doing something because you're asking yourself that question as you're doing it as opposed to being on autopilot and just doing the same old, same old every single day. So you want to spark your brain asking that question. Now sometimes, like in your case, it's going to take a while to come up with the solution because your brain needs to do some thinking and it needs to do some learning in order to learn how to implement new processes. But in the end, that investment is still worth it. So that coaching question first starts off with, is there an easier way to do this? Because that will spark your brain into wanting to improve. And I say this uh, also in cautioning people, you don't want to become neurotic about it and you know, drive yourself crazy and ask yourself, even after you've got a process in place, can I make it better? Can I make it better? Can I make it better? Because I don't want you to go to the opposite extreme where you lose time trying to make things even more and more and more and more productive. We just want to get to a place where, is there any way where I can shave off some time here? 
can I shave off 15 minutes from this process? Can I shave off 30? If so, great, go ahead and implement it. But once you've done that, you don't have to keep looking for, oh, can I shave off another 30? Can I shave off another 30? And ask yourself that every single day for three years. You don't want to drive yourself nuts. Hmm. Thank you, Helene. And I just thought of another question that we might be able to ask ourselves. And it's something along the lines of, is there a way that I can get more done in this time? As an example, if we're driving to work or somehow commuting, is there something else that we can do while we're commuting that would Mm -hmm. enrich our lives in some other way, whether it's a relaxation technique or a book on tape or something like that? Exactly. If you're doing something that does not require brain power, then that is the perfect question to ask. So if we're talking about the kind of commute where you're driving a car, maybe you're not going to do that meditation where you close your eyes like the way you centered us at the very beginning, but you could pop in an MP3 or a CD and you can listen to something as you're driving and it could be something that relaxes you. So definitely think of a way that you can fill some downtime if you have that kind of downtime in your day. And in fact, um, a commute is a great topic to bring up, Marie, because a number of clients who I work with, they might have a commute that includes their children. And so we've talked about how they're so stressed because they don't have any quality time with their kids. And so we looked at, is it possible to have quality time in the car? If you are stuck in traffic with them for 45 minutes, instead of having a griping session or you know, you're, you're trying to reach behind the driver's seat and smack somebody's legs in back of you because they're misbehaving, what if you could initiate conversations in that car that lead to quality time? And so that way you actually get to spend your traffic time instead with quality time with, with your kids. So there's definitely a way to make commute time worth it. Wow, I never even thought of that. And that sounds like it could be a whole book into itself. Of <laughs> Probably so. Somebody have, out there write the book. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, well, there is just so much more that we could talk about, but we're almost out of time. We're speaking right now with Helene Segura. She is the author of The Inefficiency Assassin, Time Management Tactics for Working Smarter, Not Longer. And She's not only the author of The Inefficiency Assassin, but she is The Inefficiency Assassin. So you can find her at helenesegura.com. Again, I'll post a link either on the podcast link or the YouTube description so that you can easily get in touch with her. You can go to my website, mariebenard.com, anytime for access and information about the show. And Helene, I'm wondering what you'd like to leave us with today. Those questions I just feel like are so juicy, but where do you want to leave us? I would like to leave you with two things. One is for all of your listeners, if you would like a complimentary productivity kit with the time management templates I use with my clients, there's even a free webinar on procrastination. You can go to timemanagementrevolution.com, fill out the form, and you will get that uh, the link to the productivity kit in your inbox. And then the last thing I'd like to leave everybody with is Wrap your mind around this. You do have the power to tell your time what to do. Wow. That is a big one. Yes, it is. And it takes some getting used to because a lot of times we tend to blame things on other people or say we had a bad day, but in the end it comes down to the decisions that we make. Time management is truly all about mind management, and that's why we do have the power to tell our time what to do. Wow. And I just want to um, tie this in because the show is all about self-improvement, and a lot of us are focused on mindfulness. And I think that really the overarching theme of the inefficiency assassin isn't just the concrete tips, but it is that mindfulness of what you're, how you're using your time. Absolutely. And through this mindfulness, that's how you're going to gain balance and peace in your life. 
So when you implement these strategies and tactics and you also remember the big picture of mindfulness and peace, that is really going to take you to great places. Mm. Wow. Thank you so much for your time, Helene. Again, we've been speaking with Helene Segura. She is the author of The Inefficiency Assassin, Time Management Tactics for Working Smarter, Not Longer. And if you want those free gifts and webinars that she mentioned, go to timemanagementrevolution.com. I'm definitely going to be going there right after we wrap up this interview. <laughs> and I just want to thank you so much for your time, Helene. It's been such a pleasure speaking with you. Oh, thanks, Marie. I have had a wonderful time. Thank you for having me on. Thank you. And thank you for how you're helping people have more in their lives, more time, more creativity, more connection because of how they're making their time work for them. Thank you. That's my passion. Yay. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> well, have a great day. You too. And you've been listening to Synchronicity Talk Radio for your mind, body, and soul. I'm your host, Marie Bernard. You can go to MarieBernard.com if you want more information about the show. You can go to HeleneSegura.com if you want more information about today's guest. And I want to send you lots of love today. Thank you so much for listening. Be well. I love you so much. Namaste.